Welcome, everyone. We're taking you out of the waiting room. We're excited to have folks here. We'll get started in a few minutes with The Revolution is Here, Transforming Community Colleges and Their Classrooms Through AI. We welcome you to enter your name and your institution and even your role in the chat to introduce yourselves. For those of you just joining, welcome. Uh, we invite you to enter in your name, your role, and your institution in the chat so we can see who's here in the room. And welcome. We'll get started in a moment. All right. Welcome, everyone. We're having folks introduce themselves in the chat and place their name and their role in their institution. Looks like we've got a great spread of faculty, administrators, and college leaders here. So thank you so much for your participation and your engagement. And we will go ahead and get started. My name is Susan Adams, and I'm Associate Director of Teaching and Learning at Achieving the Dream. And I am uh, joined here by my colleague, uh, Dr. Tanya Scott, who will introduce herself a little bit later. Um, Eric Fierro and Ryan Knight are gonna be our support in the chat. Uh, and of course, we have our speaker for today. Reed Dixon is coming to us from Pima Community College, where he is the Director for Online Faculty Experience and Innovation. Reed designs and teaches courses for faculty in online pedagogy instructional design and educational technology. So welcome, Reed. We're excited to hear from you today. Before this Reed great gets... Today. Great, thanks, Reed. Uh, before Reed gets started, we want to place us all into a shared understanding of what is generative AI, the opportunities it holds for students and faculty, and important elements for institutions to consider in embracing this new technology already in the hands of their students. Tanya, take it away. Thanks, Susan. So I'm Tanya Scott. I am Director of Program Innovation here at Achieving the Dream. It's my pleasure uh, to talk about AI and everything that we could expect and more in higher ed. Um, and the big question I think everyone has is what is generative AI? And we've all heard about ChatGPT, but um, generative AI is so much more than that. It basically is um, a collection of algorithms, right, um, that have been used, that have been created to create new content. And we can use AI to create audio, we can use it to create code, images, text, simulations, videos, the list goes on and on. And when we talk about AI, we're not talking about AI in the sci-fi sense, right? We're not talking about AI as a sentient, um, independent uh, computer system that could act on its own volition, make decisions and feel and think, right? It really is just machine learning. Um, we've all heard about predictive analytics. This is like the next tier around predictive analytics and machine learning um, that's been going on really for decades. Um, it's been, you know, we've talked about AI since even the 1950s. And so AI has been around, it's not a new concept. We've really been building on AI and its capabilities over time. And you've likely engaged with AI already. For all of us that have used you know, automated um, telephone systems to get through customer service, a lot of that has already been um, using AI already. So AI, when we talk about AI, it's not an independent entity. It really is machine learning. It's a computer system, it's a tool. 
uh, that's been trained on models. It's learned data patterns um, and really requires our human direction. It requires us to prompt it. It requires us to tell it what to do. And it really cannot act autonomously or independently. And it's just a little bit more than querying a database. We've all had to query a database before, and um, that really is reliant on really specific inputs. What's great about AI is that it can use the algorithms that it's been developed on to um, use very little prompting to make intelligent content based on what you've asked it to do. So that's really what generative AI is. That doesn't mean it won't expand and grow in the future. It already has expanded and grown in a very short amount of time since ChatGPT and other systems have been put out into uh, the general population. So it's exciting to see what's gonna come around the corner. Great. As questions come up for you, we welcome you to put questions in the chat and even comments in the chat. And when Reed comes on, he has some activities in the chat. So be sure that you have your window open and you also have the chat window open as well so you can fully engage with us. And we will be monitoring the chat to respond to your questions and we welcome you to respond to each other as things emerge throughout this webinar. So we wanna talk about areas of opportunity for AI in community colleges and higher education. We've been listening to faculty, administrators, and college leaders who are all discussing what are the opportunities here for generative AI and what are the consequences. So let's take a look at the opportunities for students. For students, AI can personalize learning paths and adapt to individual progress, ensuring students stay engaged and challenged at the right level. AI can monitor students' performance in real time and help them identify areas of struggle. And this can also lead to timely interventions, um, such as additional resources and feedback. Uh, a lot of us have already done this in other contexts, but generative AI is gonna be added to a lot of the tools you already use to make it even more comprehensive and effective. It can also act as a virtual tutor and be available round the clock offering immediate assistance. And as students learn to use it as a tutor, it can provide explanations, practice problems, and guidance tailored to their specific needs. AI can aid students in language comprehension, writing, and synthesis of ideas, and it offers grammar and style suggestions, improving the quality of essays and assignments. And institutions can design chatbots and virtual counselors, offering guidance and resources for holistic student success specific to their campus. Um, AI-powered tools help students track their progress and set goals as well. And it can also foster interactive, immersive learning experiences, virtual labs and simulations. We're going to see that explode over time as some of the simulations you might already be using are going to be enhanced by generative AI now. Um, and it also enhances traditional course materials with supplementary resources students can find, uh, recommends additional readings and videos uh, that can really support students in their learning as they have the agency to do so. So AI for faculty um, can take administrative tasks uh, away from faculty, allowing them to focus more on meaningful roles such as being a coach and a facilitator to enable their students' learning. Faculty can invest more time in personalized student guidance and mentorship. Um, it also can um, assist in the swift development and curation of course materials, reducing the burden on faculty with access to vast databases and content libraries. Um, and AI helps faculty make timely updates and improvements to course content um, and be more effective in offering, offering differentiated instruction by using the tool to ask it to redesign current content into various modes of content delivery, including video, interactive modules and simulations to cater to a wider range of student learning needs. Uh, also virtual assistants can handle routine inquiries um, and student support systems to identify at-risk students. I think a lot of us have already done that. We're, again, we're gonna see that highly enhanced uh, as the technology integrates into our existing tools. Tanya? Thanks, Susan. Um, and AI has applications, not just for students and faculty, but for student affairs and operations as well. There's a number of applications where AI can be utilized across the campus to facilitate our roles and really to enhance what we're already doing on our campuses. Um, in terms of recruitment and admissions, there's AI applications and analyzing the data, determining uh, where students are coming from, where they're not coming from, who's enrolling, who's coming back. 
um, and really help facilitate that whole admissions, registration, and recruitment process. Um, as Susan, Susan noted already, it really does help with communications for faculty, but then there's also communications from the campus as well, right? And so that can help to automate a lot of these communication tools and communication streams that we are already using on our campuses and really facilitate those touch points with the campus to the student as well. Scheduling in campus usage, if any of you have ever had to do scheduling, you know how painful it can really be. AI has lots of application to facilitate um, scheduling as well as campus usage. For many college campuses, you have to provide reports around campus usage to your respective counties. And so AI can help maximize campus usage as well as determine you know, and make more efficient building operations and energy utilization as well. It's really just a question of, of the data that you're already collecting on your respective campus and how good that data is. Security, finance, all has applications within the AI space, as well as in compliance and accreditation. Um, if you've worked in accreditation in any kind of way, you know how arduous um, and detailed that work can be. And some of you may have already used tools in the, in the past to help with those accreditation documents. Um, and so AI can help facilitate that as well. There's also the potential for new curriculum development. There is a McKinsey report that just came out not long ago, and I'm going to pop that link in the chat really quick, um, that basically says 30% um, of our work will be um, will fall under the heading of AI by 2030. And frankly, I think that's a very conservative estimate. I think it's gonna be quite a bit more. We've already seen the impacts in our workflows across various industries already. Um, and I anticipate it being considerably more, probably closer to 50% by 2030, to be perfectly honest. We're gonna also see um, a number of jobs change. Some will go away but there's gonna be new opportunities for new jobs as well. And that really is where community colleges especially can move in this space and create new programs and new curriculums. And we know that community colleges can do this. We've developed business analytics curriculums, we've developed cyber um, security, um, cyber security programs, um, mechatronics and automation already exists in our community colleges as well. And so the need for community colleges to uh, upskill and create new ways for our students to not only learn but work will be critically important. Um, I'm also going to pop another article in the link um, to talk that really shows what other community colleges are already doing in this space for you to consider. And there's also a wonderful program that's been put out by AWS Amazon uh, that's helping community colleges create uh, their own programs on their campuses at MSIs, HBSUs, as well as at um, community colleges. So there's new opportunities for new curriculum development, um, new ways to help our students learn these skills because they will be critically important for any work that they're gonna be doing in the future. right? So having these tools and these skills will be important regardless of program of study, and will help to prepare them for um, the future and how AI will be integrated into the workforce because it already is. And with that, there's also some considerations, right? We have to think about um, for, our, for our campuses, we can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, we need to think about how we're gonna be using AI on our campuses, right? We need to think about how we're going to be using it across our campuses for our own personal use as administrators and faculty. But then also we need to be thinking about the impacts in the classroom and with our students. And I know the big question is around plagiarism. And we're gonna to touch on that in just a little bit. And I know Rita is gonna be talking about this as well. We do need to be mindful of the fact that a lot of these applications, a lot of these algorithms, have been trained on biased and inequitable data, right? And so we need to be really mindful of that fact. It, it is very well known across the field that this is a pervasive problem. They are actively working to counter that, but it's important for us to put that front and center and recognize that this is an issue. So with any applications or any vendors um, that you're going to be engaging with as uh, potential solutions on your respective campuses, it will be important to understand the types of data and how they're using data and how they're building out this data um, sets to help with those algorithms. Um, and so incomplete and erroneous data, like any application, 
is also a problem. So we always need to be mindful um, of the output that AI is going to be providing us. And that's true for whatever tool we decide to use. That's true if we're using just basic, you know, SAS or Excel to help us with data. Um, and so that's equally true with any AI application as well. The same considerations that we've used in the past for any of our other vendors and applications applies to AI as well. Data privacy and confidentiality obviously is an issue. Compliance and legal aspects, I have to say, our laws have not kept up with the technology that was already true with the internet and it's only been amplified with AI. So I would say legislation and laws have not especially um, kept pace with the technology. And so I think there's more to come in that respect, um, but there's not a lot of guidance there. Uh, data integrity and integrations with vendor controlled platforms is always an issue. Again, like any vendor or solution that you're seeking to engage with, Thinking about data integrity and how that will integrate onto into your own systems is very important. Cybersecurity, the potential for deep fakes is enormous. And I really think that's really where um, AI has really become very problematic. And that's actually a new stream of cybersecurity programming, right? So for thinking about developing out new programs, the potential there for folks in cybersecurity to focus on deep fakes and um, analyzing and determining deep fakes is enormous and will be incredibly valuable to the field. Mm -hmm. Talent recruitment, retention, training of faculty and staff, that's something to consider as well. There's gonna be a tremendous need for professional learning and development of faculty and staff in adopting AI and using AI knowing how our students are using AI. There was an article that just came out that said, um, and forgive me, I'm using generational ter terms, but boomers and Gen X, and I'm Gen X, we are not using AI, uh, but Gen Z are. They vastly adopted Gen Z. Uh, Gen Zs have vastly adopted AI already. And so it's really important to think about how our students are using it because they already are, right? The, the, the lid is off the box and it's not something that we can close anymore. So we need to be really um, cognizant of that fact. The costs around that, and it's really important when you're engaging with vendors to really understand what it is that they're solutioning for, right? And we've seen that in the past with other vendors. I'm not going to name who they are, but we've all probably engaged with a vendor or two that have sold us a solution that really didn't do what it said it was going to do, right? And I would say that's equally true for any application, any vendor that comes forward that says they have a solution for you, right? There's also a potential for creating your own proprietary applications, right? So the um, the potential is, is really enormous there. And of course, there's ethics and plagiarism. And I have to say, there is no one verdict out in this space around plagiarism and ethics. Um, I have seen some institutions have a very laissez-faire approach. They defer to faculty when it comes to how AI is used in the classroom with their students. And then there's other institutions that have a no AI policy. I will just say, I caution against such an approach because um, it's not really informing our students of the vast potential for using AI. It is going to be a critical skill that our students are gonna need to be able to compete out in the workforce, right? And it's really a question of informing our students of how to use it appropriately, effectively and efficiently it has the potential to democratize education even more so than our computers or um, internet has. But there's always the question of the digital divide, right? And so the, the divide has only grown because of AI. And so from an ethics perspective, I think as educators, it's up to us to find ways and to make this more accessible to our students, to inform ourselves and our students on how to ethically use these systems, right? And there are no, there's not one plagiarism tool. I'm active in the classroom right now. There's not one plagiarism tool that's out there that is able to accurately detect AI. And that's why it's so important for us to play with these systems, learn how they work, understand the outputs that it's putting out so that you can recognize it in your students' work. And then you can have um, informed conversations with your students around how to accurately use them. Um, and so it's really a question of um, how, how we're talking about AI, how we're using AI, 
and then how we're informing our students and ourselves around ethical uh, means of usage. All right, so I think this turn, now it's Reed's turn. So we're gonna turn it over to Reed. Thanks so I much, Tanya. Great. Reed, it's all you. <laughs> Wonderful. So it's great to be with you all again. And it was uh, such an honor to be asked by Achieving the Dream to speak. Susan Adams, thank you in particular for reaching out and uh, Ryan and, and Tanya and the whole team and helping us prepare for this. That was a fantastic summary, uh, Tanya, of all the things that we need to be thinking about. In this workshop that we're going to dive into today, we're going to try to do a play-based approach, number one, because I believe that play is urgent and that we all need to start playing with the tools if we're not already. So please anticipate that I'm going to be walking you through a process where everybody in the room, I'm expecting you to pull out a phone or a second screen and play with a tool as we proceed. Um, and again, I see in the room, I think we have 184 people in the room, folks ranging from CLT directors to faculty to instructional designers, uh, vice presidents, a dean, Adult ed folks, I used to work in adult as well in curriculum coordinating adult ed. Um, number of department heads, the ATD um, president, Karen Stout. I see Sean Nuffer in the room. A lot of wonderful people here. And um, we're going to try to engage all of you as a community. We're going to be using the chat feed aggressively. So please make sure to open up your chat feed now. Uh, many of you are already using the chat feed to talk about the absurdity of banning AI. Somebody compared it to banning nitrogen in the chat feed. So please enjoy this chat feed. It's your space as we proceed. Um, without further ado, I'm gonna share my screen and we'll get started. So uh, the topic for this workshop uh, it is focused on the revolution. What we mean by what is changing all of a sudden. I'm gonna do a quick summary of all the changes that we've seen, um, but the revolution is here. Things are already shifting. And how can we transform community colleges and their classrooms through AI? This is a pedagogical opening. This is an opportunity as difficult as it can be, just like COVID was. Suddenly our faculty were open to learning new technologies, new ways of practices, new ways to improve the student experience. This likewise is a huge opportunity for us. And this is our chance to capture it. So in particular, my presentation will be focusing on the future is now. And we're gonna take a 30,000 foot view We'll be diving into a number of things. My main focus will be about how do we adapt to, but also with AI. And the second piece, how do we think about AI as a catalyst for a new era in education? Now, Tanya just mentioned a number of questions like, will AI democratize learning? Um, I think it's a great question and it's a good dilemma. It's sort of like, uh, you know, Horace Mann said, schools themselves are supposed to be the great equalizer. Um, the internet, democratize learning. Uh, a lot of folks that have created technologies have saying these are tools that are supposed to democratize the web. Um, it can go both ways. We can become gatekeeping institutions or gate opening institutions or gate busting institutions. How do we support practices with our um, use of AI that allow more access and reinforce what we already believe about teaching and learning? And that's what we're gonna be diving in and talking about today. So um, in terms of how, like the core questions we're going to be addressing first, how is AI impacting higher ed already? Another one, how will AI impact higher education? Those are two essential questions we'll be diving into. Before we dive in, I want to do a pulse check for the room. Um, and we're just going to take a couple of minutes. And you'll notice throughout here, I've used images that I've created using Bing's Dolly image creator tool. Um, we're going to take just two minutes for this, but what I want to know from you as we move forward in the chat feed, what are the first three words that come to you right now when it comes to AI? And this is something I do with my faculty at my college. I've done this with lots of different groups. Um, please put in the chat feed, what are the first three words that come to your mind? I see adventure, cool, helpful, frustrating, potential, scary, innovative, changing, personal assistance, <laughs> no clue, encyclopedic. I love seeing this blur of words uh, come through. Um, shiny, robot, challenge, infancy, thank you. Um, even the founder at ChatGPT said, this tool is at its infancy. Um, <laughs> we, we are very new to what these tools will be able to do and they're changing exponentially. 
Um, same as learning calculators. Thank you for that point. We'll talk about that as we progress. Scary, interesting, massive, just another tool. All right, lovely. Um, next question I'm going to put into the chat feed is, how are you using AI? You know, if you're not using it, just say none. If you are using AI, just playing with it, maybe you're creating recipes for things you're going to cook. Uh, maybe you are setting plans for where you want to travel this weekend using AI. If you're using it for life, say for life. And if you're using it for teaching, uh, go ahead and say that as well. Just a quick response. So I hear folks saying for work, someone's planning a trip to New Zealand right now. Um, <laughs> that's fascinating. Uh, just for living, for lesson planning, for breaking the blank page. In other words, breaking, you know, getting the words on the page is a really hard thing. I'm also a writing pedagogy person. So it's fascinating to see how this tool is shifting writing for our students and for myself as well. Train for a race. Thank you, Susan. You're using AI to train for a race? I just have to ask real quick. What do you, what, what, how are you doing that? Uh, it's a crew race. So I'm a rower and I do a lot of weightlifting and uh, conditioning. So I have 65 days till my race and I asked it to train or give me what can I do? And I only have Mondays and Wednesdays to do weight training. So it gives me a week to week, day by day, what I should do uh, when I'm in the gym versus on the water. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. So we're going to talk about your novel use cases, and I'm going to encourage you to try to play a little bit as we proceed. Final question for the chat feed poll. What percentage of your students are using AI right now? Make a guess. Whether it's allowed or not. It's anticipated in the workplace that the most common use of AI will be surreptitious. So we won't necessarily know if the ed tech tools that we're working with don't have a back-end panel, which most of them don't have any way of knowing that right now. We're not going to know unless we have good conversations with our students and they can trust us, or we promote transparent practices of some kind. So here's what we see. 3%, 5%, 40%, 90%, 100%, 100%, who knows? 75, all of them, 100%, I require it for students. Thank you, Sean. A lot of folks are playing with requiring AI from the front and setting it up as an expectation, but letting students have, of course, the choice when you start the class. They know the class is gonna be AI infused at every level. Ethan Mollick, who probably many of you have heard about, does a similar approach um, where he requires AI to be used because it's part of new digital literacy. So moving forward, it's fascinating. Um, we are going to play with some stuff as it relates to adapting. Um, I strongly believe we have to start with play for most everything we learn about. Even when I do writing exercises with my students, I begin with play. Um, so when it comes to AI, I really think we need to all start simple, not be overwhelmed with all the tools. Choose one that's going to work with you, but then play expansively and start learning every tool. I talk with faculty members every day, every week who suddenly learned that there's another tool that suddenly will rock their worlds that's a little bit different from the one they've already learned. I would just for today, choose one tool to play with and then keep expanding your set of play. So here's my cell phone. You can see I've got like 12 different AI apps at the top and we're gonna encourage you to use ChatGPT as we dive in. Uh, you can do that on your computer as well. If you prefer, both of them work just fine. You can go to chat.openai.com and just put that into your browser and open that up in a separate browser window. Um, otherwise, you could try other apps that you may already have on your phone. There is an app for ChatGPT within iOS and Google Play. There's an app for Bing, which is um, you know built in, and it's again for iOS, Google Play. Same thing with Poe. Poe is a tool that allows you to sort of compare different AIs under the hood, or not under the hood, but compare compare them to other AIs. And then there's Perplexity, which a friend of mine from Canada really likes. Um, you can see my use case of asking it to make a list of 10 of songs that build from classical music. And it lists off Lady Gaga, Maroon 5, The White Stripes, Elvis Presley. I don't know if that's accurate. I'm going to take a closer look. But choose a tool to play with today. Ideally, something you haven't played with before. Start with ChatGPT if you haven't yet. And again, you'll notice ChatGPT has a ChatGPT 4 option. That's the paid version. Incredibly, there's an incredible difference when you pay the 20 bucks a month. Uh, I should also note that um, Claude has a $20 a month version now too. Things keep changing in terms of pricing models and approaches. Um, so these are the apps that you can get on your phone. You can also, through your browser, use Claude. Um, Claude, you'll notice, has that little paperclip right next to the chat, which means you can attach a PDF or a comma-separated value set and let it analyze your set of data for you. No other tool has that. 
Uh, then, of course, we come back to Bing within Edge. So if you have Microsoft Edge, you can run Bing. If you're running Chrome, you can run Bard. Um, and then Hugging Face, our students who are in cybersecurity promote using Hugging Face to learn about all the different AI tools. They are our experts. You need to find out who your student experts are at your school, by the way. It's a huge game changer to let students guide the conversation. So um, in terms of adapting to AI, for me, we're going to play with today, today with AI so that you can work with AI tomorrow. We're going to start off with play, rapid fire, and I want to know how you have used AI in novel ways outside of the classroom. And some folks have already said, like Susan, that uh, Susan created a training schedule. Is there any way that folks have been using AI that is kind of playful or fun? I just want to see what comes through in the chat feed. Write a letter of recommendation for a friend relating to citizenship. Choose dinner. Um, ideas for vacation. Writing lyrics. Ask it to help me convince my parents to downsize. <laughs> That's great. Um, there's a lot of really complicated use cases. I've, I've heard people use it for very personal things and also for things that are quite goofy and playful. I see um, the things to do um, on vacation, writing song lyrics in a Senegalese language, et cetera. So keep sharing your ideas as they come through. And uh, I'll just suggest this, that if you have any uses that you want to share in the, in the chat feed, please do. If you don't want to share it in the chat feed, but you prefer to share it inside like a social media, I'd love to know what you're using um, after the fact, even if it comes to you after the session. So I will leave some socials here connected to this event for your social of choice, where I just would love to know how are you playing with the tool? Play matters. This is the most important way to get faculty aware of what we're using. Um, the wow factor for me is broad. Um, I started using this with everyone that I met. It could be the taxi driver that's driving me across town. It could be an old friend who's uh, just reflecting on how they could have gotten into a state that had better set up for undocumented students. And they did a search relating to states which would have been a better choice for them. And it did hallucinate a little bit, but it got a lot of things right. Um, in this example here, I have a role play that I'm doing where I'm asking AI to talk to me like a friend. And you can train it to do short conversations and be a, like for me, a, a character that would be a good friend to talk to, the goof around, surprising how effective it is at talking with us. It can create, this is ChatGPT, it can create music that you can play. Uh, you can create a playlist of music. Um, if you haven't tried creating playlists, it, it, we had a huge rain in Tucson. And I was like, I want a playlist based on the rain. What do you got? Um, another use case is just analyzing, you know, the differences between different um, things like SCORM and uh, XAPI, et cetera. It can create tabular analysis. Um, and this is Google Bard, but all these tools have the ability uh, that's expanding to create tables that analyze and compare that are astonishingly effective. Um, Snapchat is another use case. My daughter, when we were driving to school yesterday, said, Daddy, I can talk to um, Snapchat in Spanish, and it will respond in Spanish. So that's an audio recording responded to in Spanish. Same thing in Persian. She posed a question in, in, in Farsi, and it responded, giving the basically the words for the, each number of, uh, you know, one, two, three, four, five, yek, do, se. So these tools are at are changing quickly. Snapchat is not the best AI. I, I should note that, but kids are using it. Kids are using all kinds of stuff. Um, so in terms of novel use cases, again, please share it forward, um, put it in the chat feed. And if you don't know about transcript links, try one of those. So you may not be aware of this yet, but in the upper right-hand corner, and this is where they've recently moved it, there is an upward arrow coming out of a inbox. If you click on that upward arrow, you can share the transcript within ChatGPT, which for us is huge because then we can get a sense of cognitive work. What is AI created versus what is the student creating within the transcript? We have to think of creative ways to promote transparency. And this is one just for the sake of play, where if you have an interesting discussion with the AI, you can send the whole thread to us. And if you'd like to share any example, I think somebody already did it, Corey Bergeron, thank you for being the first to share an actual chat transcript in the chat feed. Uh, likewise, you'll see that the same uh, capacity is in BARD now. So if you click on the export response options, you can send it to Google um, Docs, you can send it as an email, or you can actually send it as a link. Um, they're a little bit different. 
play with them, please. Claude does not have that option yet, but um, these other tools do. Core point that I wanna make in terms of play and the urgency of play, and this is from the time for class study, that students, you know, this is back in March, I think, 48% of students were using AI, only 39% of, of faculty were using AI and, and administrators even less. This gave me a lot of pause as a statistical point. If you haven't read this report, um, download it, upload it to Claude, and let Claude summarize the report for you with the core statistics by page number. It can do that. Um, so going into the primary takeaway for me, how can we bring AI into learning or set guidelines without having firsthand experience? We need more experience, and play is a great way to start, especially for faculty administrators. AI play is nothing short of urgent. And so, um, quick note on my AI story. Back in January, my Dean for Sciences and I were talking about their faculty development needs and we spoke about AI. And she said, you know what? This is gonna be around the corner. Um, I agree with you, let's dive in and, and do a workshop. And I suggested let's do it together with her team. We had probably 80 faculty show up, including faculty outside of the sciences who were aching to know about what was happening. And then everything just started moving very quickly from that point. So that by the time April happened, we'd had a number of workshops with faculty and we even had a panel with our chancellor and two online students among others that were experts that taught us quite a bit. It was a whirlwind tour. And what I realized in April, which I think we all know, is that, fact that our students, bring expertise to the class that we really need to lift up. Uh, one of our students on the panel said that he goes to ChatGPT as his cherished friend, and he will go at two in the morning down a rabbit hole and say, please explain to me quantum mechanics like I'm a seven-year-old. Okay, now explain to me like I'm 12. Okay, now explain it to me like I'm 19. Okay, now explain to me like I'm 24. Each time, you know, as any good constructivist would think, is progressive complexity. So he's learning a simple way of understanding it, and then a more complicated with near synchronous feedback, almost immediate feedback that helps him conceptualize more effectively at two in the morning when there's not going to be anyone that could support him. So this is an incredible learning aid. And the, a lot of the talk right now is about it being a cheating aid. We hear that. But practically speaking, so is the calculator. So we have to slow down and think, okay, well, what are the positive use cases for our students and how do we guide them in transparent use so that we don't have to go down the policing and policy um, sort of other rabbit hole, so to speak. We do need to think about these things. We will dig into them. But my focus right now is how can we learn from our students? And who are the experts? Right now, there are no experts. We're all novices. The experts that are emerging are simply those that are AI curious. I encourage you to leap in and to learn from your peers and to learn from your students. Um, the adapting to and adapting with in terms of what are we adapting to. Here's a quick whirlwind tour of AI, um, teaching, learning, and life. And I'm gonna fly through these so that we can get to some other pieces. First off, ChatGPT moves to a million users in five days. Netflix took three and a half years. Uh, then within two months, ChatGPT got to 100 million users. Um, in September of 2022, Dolly came out, which is the image generator and then by March of 27, or March of 2023, tools like Midjourney were used to make really high gloss versions of AI photo fakes. Um, fascinating use cases for graphic design. Grammarly Go now has AI. Grammarly has AI now under the hood within Grammarly. And uh, we should also note that tools like um, Khan Academy have AI under the hood with personalized Socratic coaching built in underneath it. Um, our core office products are going to release, and I expect it'll happen within the year, AI within the within all the Office products that we're using. That includes Microsoft. It also includes Google. I got permission from Google Workspace Labs to share this image because I'm also part of their pilot, but this is what it looks like on the inside. It says, help me write, as soon as I open up Google Docs. What does that mean for writing and how that's gonna change the writing process? Same thing for spreadsheets. It says, help me organize on the side, a marketing campaign material tracker for a new product launch. It's going to coach us on things that we might want um, in ways we can't even anticipate. Uh, we should also note that there has been a lot of news about the AI detection tools that are out 
that have high false positive rates um, where they've acknowledged, and this is different companies acknowledge that, yeah, we are getting things wrong. We didn't realize that that 98% you've plagiarized may be an issue, as one of my faculty colleagues this morning said, of length in terms of whether it was a short piece of writing versus a long piece of writing. It may actually be um, messy relating to the fact that AI will tend to more likely ding non-native speakers around misuse of the tool. So there's issues with the detection tools. Moving forward, um, ChatGPT Enterprise came out last week. Or was it last week? Uh, yeah, it was a little bit over a week ago. That's huge because there's capacity in the future to see that there will be a data secure opportunity that is not just for businesses, but for schools. We're just not there yet. But we're seeing the technology shift quite a bit. And GPT Enterprise just came out last week. I think it's a big deal. Uh, we see Baidu that just moved out with their own specific chat feed called Ernie, I believe, or Ernie Bot. And that is taking over the market in China. We'll see US AI competing with Chinese AI. And it's going to be a whirlwind. When I use the tool, and I, especially with my phone, I can hear it sort of vibrating as it's thinking. It's fascinating to me. I don't really understand how one word at a time it can so brilliantly generate so much information. Um, and I'm going to pull from Arthur C. Clarke, who says any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. To me, it's magical. It's fun and it's complicated. It's good and it's bad. It's here to stay. Um, moving forward towards paraphrasers, in case you don't know about them, writer is an important thing to think about as a tool that students are using. They might use ChatGPT and then they'll run it through writer after they use ChatGPT. It's a language paraphraser. Same thing with something like a uh, cactus. So these are tools that allow you to create content. And then there's Quillbot, which has been around for a while. And folks probably have used Quillbot to paraphrase language from one sort of language of power into another discourse that might be easier to understand. Um, so again, there can be positive uses of all these tools and negative ones, good uses and misuses. Um, let's not also forget about ed tech under the hood. We've seen a lot of ed tech companies that have come through and brought in teacher side AI. So I'm thinking in particular of tools like Packback and Feedback Fruits. Um, I'm also thinking of um, most recently there was a one of the LMSs has launched a AI support tool on the back end and mainly for teachers to support, um, and maybe somebody in the chat feed can, thank you, Corey, Blackboard. So Blackboard Anthology has brought in our ability to use AI um, as an AI design assistant. Again, it's for faculty. And the same thing that happens with Packback and Feedback Fruits, they have teacher side AI support to make our lives easier, to make the tedious work of grading, for example, a little bit easier so that it assists us in our progress. Um, we're seeing tools like H5P that have AI interactive creators. So we can dump a PDF or a video into tools like that, and it will create multiple choice practice questions, um, things that can help us with knowledge checks that are ideally low stakes formative assessments. Um, but we, there's a lot of stuff happening in ed tech where we're going to have to make choices as, inst as institutions around which tools we want based upon what AI is under the hood. And it's going to change quickly. Every few months, we're going to see new product tweaks and changes without always the best communication relating to the rollout. Um, some of you may be familiar with that relating to even turnitin.com. It suddenly rolled out. Some folks were not happy with it. Some institutions actually turned off the AI detection because they were not happy with it. It's a mixed bag because as one of my friends said, once you turn it off, you have no way of knowing where teachers are cutting and pasting their papers online to other tools. How do you track uh, the use of these tools? It's complicated. So here's an image called the woe factor. I used AI to go ahead and create the woe factor as presented by robots with American Gothic as the style. Um, it's not all about the woe, it's also about the woe. Uh, what are the complexities that lie ahead? Please in the chat feed, if you think of any complexities that come to mind for AI-minded educators, what are the ones that come to mind for you? And I'm glad to share some, but I wanna know what's on your mind first. And so I see teaching healthcare topics is the first point that's raised. I will say this one, one of the institutional questions is, you know, how do we use student data as it relates to AI and FERPA? Can 
teachers use AI for grading? I'm gonna, I'm gonna let me read some of your ideas before I get too many of my own. Um, having students value their own thought process is a great point that's been brought in. Everyone needing training on how to use and for what purposes. Um, having students value their own thought process was already mentioned. What are the ethics of sharing student work with these tools for analysis? Wonderful. These are wonderful points. And even the question of students asked to do peer feedback with their peer, what do they do? During the next session for ATD, you'll talk more about the pedagogy and the policy. So we're not going to dig into these kinds of questions, but we want you to be thinking about them and talking about them right now. Um, in terms of these sticky questions, and again, this is another image that I created using AI. I asked it to create a honey dipper version of the letter Q. Um, it's fun to play with. I can't say this enough. Um, if you're playing and you want to share images with each other as we proceed, please do. Um, I'm trying to encourage the spirit of play even as we tackle this rapidly changing technology. So in terms of some sticky questions on misuses institution-wise, um, we do had early news back in February that, that um, uh, after the mass shooting at Michigan State, Vanderbilt used ChatGPT on an email that went out relating to the shooting. And it came out in the news in The Guardian and elsewhere on, you know, what are the appropriate uses of AI? Um, one faculty member put all of his papers into ChatGPT and asked, hey, did my students cheat? And ChatGPT said yes. And he gave them all Fs. <laughs> and it was wrong. It was actually entirely wrong. This is, we need to anticipate misuse as much as we anticipate novel use. Um, and think about how to plan and guide folks and get them aware of what's possible and what's not, I think, through play. Um, other things to keep in mind, again, this is a piece from um, Stanford that notes that AI detectors are biased against non-native English writers. What does that mean for our tools? That's huge. I saw some folks in adult ed in the room thinking about the use of AI within an adult ed classroom is in particularly quite interesting, or in an ESL classroom, or in a classroom in which the student has been working closely with the tutor, and it still comes back that there's 98% likelihood of using AI because it's a short uh, discussion post. What do we do with that? It's a dilemma. Um, another question, how may AI open or close gaps? And in particular, I'm thinking about students with disabilities, but there's also students that have less digital access in the first place, who work in rural areas, who work on native nations, et cetera. Um, it is an incredible assistive learning tool. The student that I mentioned who loves to go rabbit, down rabbit holes at two in the morning is autistic and identifies as such and said he likes to go down autistic rabbit holes. It helps him learn. Um, it's complicated. Um, it's not going to help everyone and it's going to be continuously changing. Uh, you'll see here we've got Google Duet and Microsoft 365. There's also the pricing question. How will these impact equitable learning? Once we have a two-tiered system for learning, does that mean we're going to have a two-tiered system for education? That's a dilemma. Um, and maybe we'll have an enterprise license that are different institutions that allow folks to use AI under the hood within Google or within Microsoft. Um, you know, as I noted, Claude has a $20 fee for the advanced version. Same thing with ChatGPT has 4.0, which is much better than 3.5. Um, what will that do for learning when students have different access to different tools? The baseline tools are fantastic, but the step up is even better. Um, final piece that I want to note that Van Davis emphasizes from WCET is relating to data sovereignty or data choice. What should students' data sovereignty look like when it comes to their choices? Um, if you haven't thought about this question, it's important to think about how do we engage students in making informed choices, really having informed consent about how their data is being used by teachers, by peers, et cetera. These are tough questions. And some of these questions, again, we don't have simple answers. Oops, I'm going to go back to the screen I was sharing, sorry about that. Um, the other core question for me is what might help schools not shift towards educational policing? And the reason why I say this, is, again, comes back to the, we all need to have policies, but we're good at education. We're not necessarily good at the work of interrogating and investigating and finding out who did what, and then responding to it in a way that's educative rather than punitive. Uh, we do know that 51% of students will continue to use generative AI, even if their instructors or institutions prohibit it. That's from the time for class study. We know that our students are going to be using it. 
So how can we think proactively around, okay, well, how do we coach them on positive and appropriate uses rather than trying to ban it? Because they're gonna use it anyway. As somebody said, it's gonna be very difficult to ban a tool like this. Um, moving forward, some other core questions to think about. How can we scaffold AI use and digital literacy with AI in mind to limit the AI digital divide? If you pose this question to your phone as we're talking, please share a, a transcript in the chat feed of what you see as a response. I'd love to see that kind of happening. Um, other questions relating to how might students and teachers unethically or ethically use AI for writing, for peer feedback, for grading, et cetera. Um, these are dilemmas. Do we have guidelines with faculty around how they can use AI relating to assessment? Most of us don't. And this is a pedagogical decision as well. It's an academic freedom question as well. Uh, these are things you need to be talking with your faculty about together, uh, not in silos, but as a multi-stakeholder stakeholder approach, as Angela Gunder has said at OLC, it's really important that we bring as many people to the table, including students. And I'll come back to that in a, in a bit. Um, faculty and staff development are, are huge pieces as well. Like what kinds of things are needed? We could ask the AI to help us in, in, in interrogate these questions, but most importantly, we also talk to each other. How can students success professionals design support with AI bots in mind? How can tutors better tutor knowing that faculty, that students are gonna be using AI to learn and to revise and to outline and to brainstorm titles, et cetera. Um, and again, going back to this most this important point, how do, how do we have a multi-staker approach that engages not just one silo or two silos, the IT house, the academic house, but also our students? How do we bring everyone to the table and make sure that they feel invested in policies as they merge? Tricky questions. In terms of adapting to, um, we're using the chat feed to respond. Please let us know what your thoughts are, what you're, what you're sensing. How are you responding to AI at this moment at your institution? I'd love to see folks share a word or two. And Sean, thank you for sharing that image in the chat feed. I don't know if everybody can see it, but there's a teddy bear that um, I'd love to know what you use to create that. But anyway, how are we responding to AI in this moment? You know, are we learning AI? by ourselves on our own? If so, great. We need to start playing, all of us need to. Um, are we setting expectations for our students? And I don't just mean the syllabi, but that's key. Um, you know, we've been encouraging our faculty if they don't have an addendum to their syllabus to include an addendum that just says, here's what I expect relating to AI usage. Because if you have any leaning towards saying no, you still need to set the expectation before you don't want to create a gotcha experience for your students where you haven't already set the expectation in the first place. Um, what are the positive ways they might use AI in the classroom is a core question to consider. Um, are you setting any kind of, or doing any kind of communications with your students during the first week, et cetera? Um, I'm going to scroll down to the chat feed um, because I see some different pieces here. Great question about AI and assessment, says Karen Stout. Um, who notes the question of two-tiered systems. These are, I love this chat feed. Um, please keep talking with each other as we go. But adapting to is different from adapting with. This is kind of response to the AI moment. Yes, we need to learn the tool. Yes, we need to have syllabi statements. Yes, we have to have an activity during our first week or in our first module that helps, you know, talk about the elephant in the room, which is AI, and sets expectations about proper use, and also maybe shows how AI fails doing demos like uh, with our students about what's possible and what's not currently. And I do think it's important to think about these worst case or regressive responses. I did a workshop for EDUCAUSE back in March in which we had like a hundred instructional designers in the room and many of them said that some of their faculty are moving back to blue books and high stakes tests because they don't know if the writing that's happening is their students. So as much as I wanna be optimistic, Susan, about everything that's happening here, I think on the flip side, it can go either way and it will go both ways. It is plausible that we'll see really positive and negative responses to the use of the tool. We may move towards our core values of teaching, supporting independent learning, supporting project-based learning that's relevant to their college and career goals, supporting things that actually transform the problem of the discussions that we see in our classrooms. Or we can see ones that actually make things worse. We'll see 
a lot of stuff happening. And if we don't have a lot of regular discussions with our peers around this, then we will lose out on the opportunity or this pedagogical opening to make transformative practices shift. I do think it's important to look at where this is going wrong. And so I, I can't say enough, please imagine the worst as well. How might this be misused? Um, pivoting to the end with point, uh, we're looking at how might, how might we adapt with AI? And this is a question for the chat feed. If you have thoughts, please share them with your peers. I wanna know how you're already working with AI in your classrooms. So some of our faculty will have an assignment in which they're expected to use AI and to explain how they use AI. And one thing I've been promoting is to please share a transcript as part of your process so that you can transparently show how you're using the tool. What is What are you doing cognitively versus what is AI creating in conjunction with you. But I'm gonna scroll down and I wanna know how you're using AI already in the classroom. I see Heather Brown sharing an open source doc on syllabi policies, thank you. Um, there's the question from Rebecca, I'd love to see you in, in the chat feed here about blue books. And there's an argument for blue books. There's an argument for and against. Honestly, it's hard to, hard to uh, have an absolute moral position except that we do know that there's test anxiety for students. And there's issues with different types of testing that will also have its equity challenges. So scrolling down back to, or excuse me, staying with how we're using AI and working with AI in the classrooms, I see, I show my students the AI's answer to almost every question we ask, and then we discuss it as if it was another student. Thank you. Brilliant. And again, we're learning as we go. Inviting AI to the table helps us understand what AI is getting wrong and helps us all sort of normalize, okay, well, what is the place of AI in the future? And I think we've got some audio feedback in one of the, if we can mute the, wonderful. So um, moving forward, um, how might we scaffold student use for GPT is another core question. If we don't scaffold, and there's been some research by Sarah Grace, who's a colleague of mine at the University of Arizona saying, if we're not scaffolding practice, we're not gonna get the outcomes we're looking for. Um, how do we promote inquiry using tools, helping them create better questions? We don't necessarily know, and our students don't necessarily know, but we can learn together. Um, so continuing forward with this, how do we promote trans, uh, transparent metacognitive reflection with our students is a key question. I wanna put into the chat feed a article that, um, that I put together, which is on transparent practices. Uh, let's see if I can pull it up here. I don't have it at, at fingertips, but I'll bring it back in in a second. For me, the question is how do we promote transparency with our, our students and proactively engage with AI as educators? Um, the AI article that I wrote, if you wanna Google it, is at CC Daily, Community College Daily, which is called The Elephant in the Room. How do we promote transparent AI practices? Um, how can we advance AI use cases for learning aids? Again, that's an adapting with piece. How do we advance AI course audits? which is not just AI proofing the classroom, but thinking how do we make our every assignment that we do something where AI could be used as part of the assignment in transparent ways to help students as a learning aid. Um, if you have ideas on these pieces as we go, please let me let me know, but I wanna move through through these quickly. I wanna hey, think Reed, about we, how- we've got a, Hey Reed, we've got about two minutes left. Just wanna let you know okay. before we're at the hour. Wonderful. So I'm gonna just uh, keep moving through these very quickly as a closure point. We need to think about what's next for AI as a catalyst for what we believe. Some core values that are important for us to think about is we've had disruptions before. We've had the graphic calculator. How did the math faculty respond to that? Um, in short, they were able to rethink some of assessments and think about how do we assess during the process as they go, not just looking at final assignments. Um, this is a general purpose technology, as Ethan Mollick and others have noted, like electricity. It's going to be touching everything. What might we rethink? How might we transform what we're doing? And what might we hold on to? Um, writing a, a piece with Kevin Kelly, where he mentions the idea of other AIs, like authentic inquiry, anxiety information. I mentioned Argo Interpreter, actual assignments, but other kinds of AIs where we can engage students in using AI in positive ways or build on our actual insights and basically work on the things that AI cannot do and be able to tell the story of what are we bringing to the table, um, either without AI or with AI. Um, finally, moving forward in terms of the questions that I think are important to just leave you with, 
how may AI improve the experience of faculty and students five years down the road? It's not an immediate piece, but we want to hold on to our core beliefs, supporting higher order learning, supporting equitable, personalized, adaptive experiences. We don't want to just fo follow the shiny, the shiny, uh, what's it called? The <laughs> shiny object syndrome. We need to pull back and say, what do we believe and how do we use AI to improve those kinds of pieces? Um, I'm going to go ahead and end this recording here, or this is the slide share and pull back for a second. I have a lot to say that I think is super sort of timely, but my most important thing that I would want to say as a takeaway from this talk is please play. Please promote a culture of play within your institutions. Please start talking to each other and talking with your students and letting your students be experts in the classroom. They bring so much that we need to build upon. So thank you for having me, with me, me, me today. Susan, I think we have a moment for some Q&A as well. Thank you so much, Reed. This has been so much activity in the chat. We're gonna download that and, and garner a lot of insights. Thank you all so much. We will be sending out the recording and the deck. Uh, we also welcome you to put any topics, if you have a few more minutes to stay on, uh, to put topics that you would like uh, that would be supportive to enhancing your practice. Uh, we wanna support you in all the ways. Um, and we are going to be having a part two of this webinar series, um, and that will be on, actually, I don't have the date at, at handy, but we'll put that in the chat as well, and there'll be announcements made on our ATD website. Uh, colleagues, is there anything else I'm missing to wrap this up? Just to remind everyone that we have our part two on October 3rd, um, that will uh, serve as a second part to this webinar. And we will have several sessions around this topic and AI at our Teaching and Learning Summit, October 26th and 27th. Uh, so if you haven't registered for that, please do. I want to say one thing as I see the chat feed coming in. When I was at Grail recently, I guess it was a few months ago, folks were saying AI is not going to replace you, but somebody who knows AI will. And I think it's important for us to think about what's the future of colleges right now, perhaps around a similar framework, which is that AI is not gonna replace the college or the community college, but another college or another for-profit who knows how to use AI better will be stiff competition. And so it is imperative for us to start playing, to start digging into these tools and to start learning alongside our students, knowing that you know this is, if you believe in uh, flipping the model of the banking model that Paulo Freire talks about, this is the opportunity to let students be experts and to make it part of learning. And it's going to be moving so quickly that we can't expect to be experts ourselves forevermore. That's a positive for me. To me, it's a positive disruption that we get to rethink expertise in the classroom, that we get to rethink what are meaningful assignments for our students that they can use beyond the moment we're in. It's, it's a fascinating moment we're in. So you'll notice, again, Ryan did put the registration note for the next workshop. And I would strongly recommend you going to think about, you know, some of the things we've talked about more carefully, but also to return to our humanness, which is a point that Dr. Estrada will be raising on 10-3. She's going to be digging into daily practices that we can consider relating to how do we communicate AI expectations? How do we advance cross-functional non-siloed teams? How do we promote play? Um, if you have questions or thoughts, please, again, feel free to reach out to me um, through whatever social media of choice works best for you. And I'll be glad to um, share my two cents. I would love to know, as a final closing piece, if there's anything that you found particularly useful, again, um, please go to your social media of choice and just say, this part was useful for me. This question actually mattered for me. Um, I want to know what's useful always. And if you had a really playful use case of an AI, I'd love to know that as well. Thank you, Dr. Sandra, for saying all of it. <laughs> that was not written by ChatGPT as a response. Um, there's so much to think about, and we're not experts. We're not, but we need to work together to create collective uh, expertise with our students, with our peers. Um, it's exciting, and it is daunting. And I would just encourage you to play your way through it. Thanks so much, Reed. Thanks, everybody, for your time. We really appreciate you being here. Reed, if you want to stay on a little bit longer, we'd appreciate that. Um, and thanks, everybody. Thanks all for being here. We'll see you October 3rd. <laughs>